series. I am Sam Kling from the Evaluation Sciences Unit um, and help organize uh, this lecture series with uh, many of my colleagues who are on the call today. Um, first announcement, um, this lecture series is twice a month. Uh, so our next uh, seminar will be March 26th. Um, and the title will be in your inboxes soon, um, but we hope to see you there on March 26th, same time and place. Um, today, uh, I have the honor of introducing our speakers, uh, Dr. Ashley Peterson and Anna Lesios uh, is going to uh, be here for the discussion at the end of today's presentation. Uh, Dr. Peterson is a clinical assistant professor in anesthesiology, perioperative, and pain medicine. Um, her focus areas are cardiac anesthesia, care of complex uh, uh, patients for non-cardiac surgery, and is a quality improvement leader in their department. Um, Ashley uh, completed her fellowship and her residency here at Stanford University um, and became uh, the Associate Physician Improvement Lead for the Department of Anesthesiology in 2013. Um, I am excited to introduce Ashley as we worked on this great project together uh, during I think two fiscal years of the ICDP cycle ago. Um, and it was a joy uh, for the USU to collaborate with you, Ashley. And uh, welcome and uh, excited to hear updates. Thank you. I have to say that's the first time I think I've ever been introduced. So very much appreciated. And I've come to this lecture series many times. So very honored to be invited to speak to everyone today. I echo Sam's uh, sentiment. The partnership with the ESU was fantastic and really elevated this project to a new level. So excited uh, and honored to be able to talk about the project to everyone here today and to get everyone's opinions and thoughts because as we know, all improvement projects are works in process. So uh, without Further ado, Anna and I are very excited to be here to talk to you today. So Anna is a research operations manager in the Evaluation Sciences Unit. She's got extensive experience in health services work on chronic pain, integrative health, and cross-cultural mental health fields from her work in Boston. And she was a fantastic uh, project manager for this project and did some serious data acquisition, cleaning, and analysis, as well as um, putting a lot of this uh, presentation together. And so she'll be present to talk about some of the deeper questions we might get on the mixed methods uh, that we utilize. So really had a great time uh, working with Anna. And of course, this is me. So let's start by describing the quality reporting system that we built uh, that was in parallel to an existing uh, quality reporting system already present at Stanford. So many of you are likely familiar with the hospital-wide incident reporting system, which we uh, broadly have deployed here at Stanford Adult Hospital, which allows any employee with access to the hospital intranet via a computer or approved home device with two-factor authentication to report on potential or realized patient safety events. The system allows for anonymous reporting, contains both free text and mandatory drop-down fields, and allows you to categorize the event location, event type, and severity. Reports are reviewed by a hospital-level safety team, which consists of nursing and operational quality experts. And depending on the incident severity, the team will carry out its own critical event review or forward the report to another relevant leadership team or nursing or physician leader for a response. We also have a more new second reporting system, which mirrors the first that I just described but it allows reporting of behavioralism or professionalism related events. Now within the Department of Anesthesiology, our quality teams recognized that we really had poor engagement of our physicians with the hospital-wide system due to a couple of anecdotal hunches, namely difficulty accessing the system and using the system, given that it's a bit cumbersome for physicians and it uses language that's more nurse oriented uh, in the types of reports that you can submit. And we also found that follow-up on the reports were a bit opaque. We knew there was a structure to follow up um, 
that was uh, really robust for the hospital, but oftentimes it gave uh, physician leadership limited ability to review and track reports for systematic issues involving anesthesia care delivery. So we set to work within the department developing a complementary incident review system specific to the delivery of anesthesia care in the operating room to address some of these hunches that we had about the challenges. So it was an adaptation of several other pre-existing systems, including one here at LPCH and one at MGH. So we thank the creators of those for their sharing their uh, structures with us so we could build ours similar to functional ones at other institutions. And this new point of care anesthesia specific system is embedded within the EHR with mandatory comment on closure of the patient's intraoperative record. We use perioperative language and our anesthesiologists are asked to characterize any report as a quality concern or notable event or a kudos, which is a positive event or something that went well. And there's a further checklist of 50 quality or safety event categories that's provided once, uh, once you uh, access the system. So here's the panel that the anesthesiologist sees in their work environment. This is the quality report button, which can be used during the case, but it becomes a mandatory completion on closing of the chart. And so selecting of this button opens up a window for the initial report type selection. Our goal is to make this as painless as possible with as few clicks as possible, as the, we hope the majority of cases will have no events to report. And so the provider can theoretically make two clicks and be done. We tried to devise with the ESU a better mousetrap and make one click and done, um, but we, we couldn't quite streamline it that much. Uh, so on selecting a quality event, uh, you can see the structure of event types displayed here, which are quite specific and tailored to the delivery of anesthesia care in the operating room. We have equipment issues, uh, airway or respiratory issues, pharmacy or medication issues, transfusion related concerns, procedural complications. And these are things, you know, procedures that are performed in the OR, uh, patient inquiries and, and, and other miscellaneous things. So these are really tailored to the delivery of care in the operating room. At the end, you have a free text box and free text box seem like the Grand Canyon to some folks and really intimidating, but we do get a lot of uh, free text entry and that's where we get a lot of the meat of our reports. So happy that we do have that free text available there. So we developed this system in conjunction with our existing hospital wide system. And the folks that ran that, um, that do run that were uh, integral in how we constructed this system, such that any uh, reports that need to be reported to the hospital wide system uh, would be encouraged to be entered in both. And so here you see um, when you select, for instance, an equipment malfunction, you see in blue there, it's a hyperlink that will take you to the hospital-wide reporting system. So in that way, we try to be very thoughtful and not prevent any information from getting to the wider hospital reporting system. So now that the system is built, we needed to do something with the reports we were getting. So we formed a subcommittee of our quality council who review the reports on a monthly basis. They're volunteers who sign confidentiality agreements and rotate their responsibility to review reports each month. Reports generate quality projects. They generate collaboration with our anesthesia technician leadership and biomedical technical leadership, as well as interventional platform nursing and administrative leadership. We had built and deployed this new reporting system, but we had not yet been able to understand engagement with the system, look for pitfalls and how the culture or opinions of the faculty about this new system were similar to or different from the existing hospital-wide system. In other words, did we really do a good job at building a better capture tool or a better mousetrap and enter the evaluation sciences unit? This is where we were really fortunate to partner with these guys so um, we could take a deeper look into engagement and culture around safety and quality reporting in our department. So what was the question of our, our collaboration and, and what was the aim? So in this mixed methods evaluation, we sought to identify barriers to quality and safety reporting amongst healthcare professionals working in the surgical setting in our large academic health system and we wanted to inform the ongoing improvement of this new reporting system 
embedded within the EHR, uh, specifically for anesthesiologists. So it was no small task. Evaluate culture, super easy, right? <laughs> Not at all. There ended up being three components to our uh, study and analysis. The first was really the meat of it, a semi-structured interview with the interventional platform care providers, a variety of them listed there, anesthesiologists, surgeons, operating room nurses, and some of the quality improvement project team members themselves. The second was an analysis of the reports we received from the first eight months of data. And the third was an analysis of a survey that we uh, administered to our faculty at two faculty meetings. The methods and analysis that we used on the interview data, and this is really where Anna can shine and speak much more eloquently about uh, the methodology that was used. Um, suffice it to say, we used the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety or the SEEPS 2.0 framework. And this allowed us to uh, characterize and stratify many of the quotations from the interviews into a framework that showed the complexity of interactions between people and systems involved in submitting or choosing not to submit an incident report. It also demonstrated the work factors, which either drove in great engagement or created additional barriers. We looked at trends in the reports themselves. We described the total number of reports over time and by month, the number of unique reporters per month, and the number of unique patient encounters with a report. And we use these to better understand uh, a rough number of engagement with the system. And finally, we evaluated the survey data to compare changes in perspectives on the system over time. Dun, 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 what did we find? You might ask yourself. I We, we certainly did. And this is the fun part and was really quite interesting and exciting for us. Um, we collected a total of 964 quality or safety reports in just eight months of the initial go live, which is quite a bit of reporting. We had between 47 and 76 unique reporters each month. So those are unique faculty engaging with the system to uh, enter in uh, quality reports. And our department has around 200 faculty, give or take, um, not all of whom practice in the OR in the adult hospital. And so this is a significant proportion of our faculty that we're submitting reports and continue to. Our top reporting categories were things like equipment and technology issues, my computer's not working, my phone is broken, or the vital sign monitor cuts out in the middle of the case and has to get turned back on. Um, Clinical complications were also up there at about 25% of reports. This is everything from known side effects to, of the delivery of anesthesia care, like stroke or heart attack, uh, to medication errors or other more simple clinical care issues. And then unsurprisingly, one of the banes of our existence is poor communication or poor coordination of care. So 20% of reports uh, were in this category. And things are these are things like uh, scheduling concerns, um, care delays, or breakdowns in team communication. So a lot of data that we're capturing. The interviews were really the meat of the effort. This took hours to schedule an interview, clinical care providers of all different varieties. And then there was the translating, de-identifying, and coding all of the responses. And so my hats go off to the ESU team and Anna, who really spearheaded this. Um, this was such a project. Uh, this was such a resource that they provided this project with. And really, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. The interviews were semi-structured and that certain questions were asked to start conversations and then where the conversation went from there was open. And through these interviews, uh, themes emerged. I now know they're called emergent themes and we go until we find thematic saturation, meaning you feel like you've gotten enough of the same topics over and over that you're not missing major themes. And many people would mention the similar concepts, perspectives, experiences, or opinions. And these are some examples of the types of data quotes that we abstracted from the interviews. You see um, some people saying, it may be because we have no idea where the hospital-wide reporting system link is, or it's not intuitive for a clinician who was a physician to use. It's not structured in a way that it will take the types of reports that we should submit frequently. So what I think we saw was we had a hunch as to what our problems and barriers to engagement were, um, but that's not actually understanding a baseline. And so this helped us to really understand that um, we were in fact going after 
um, the right barriers to engagement. Um, but I'll show you here in a second, as we inserted these into the SEEPS 2.0 framework, where we, we put a lot of these themes into different categories, that it's not that we've actually essentially addressed all of the barriers. So the framework categories here are person, task, tools, and technology. Person-related comments included ability to access the hospital system. And this was one of the areas in which our special, excuse me, specialty specific system did address some of the barriers. You can see that ours is embedded in the EHR and it's mandatory to complete. So we did address this barrier that was identified. Tasks related or task related themes included a lack of protected time to complete reports or stress at reliving a traumatic event again in order to, to submit a report. And unfortunately, both of these are not necessarily addressed by our specialty specific system. Technological themes were more likely to be solved by the specialty specific system with again, its location inside the EHR and importantly, anesthesia specific nature of the language and categories. Finally, we have organizational and environmental themes. These are some of the much more interesting ones and sometimes a little bit more controversial. They included concern for retaliation and lack of psychological safety after submission of reports. These did seem to be less of a concern with the specialty specific reports as the system was inherently not designed to capture professionalism reports. But it was interesting to note that some of the same themes were not expressed when respondents were asked about the specialty specific system. We also noted in the organizational section that there are expectations for nurses to be trained in using the hospital system and onboarded when they begin working here, while physicians are not necessarily onboarded in how to use the specialty specific or the uh, hospital-wide system. Um, but for our specialty specific system, it's required as part of chart closure and we do instruct our physicians on how to use it. Anonymity and protection of the reporter were big themes, but were not completely addressed by our specialty specific system because our reports are not technically anonymous but the culture uh, expressed around the specialty specific system did not seem to include as much expressed fear about identification of the reporter. Here we see the results of the two surveys that we performed on faculty. In the first survey, asked respondents to the hospital and specialty specific ones. And in the second survey, respondents were only asked about the special. specific system and we looked for changes in opinions about the system over time. Hospital-wide system and with more concern for punitive action. Over time it was apparent Oh no, we're losing your audio Ashley. Um that around in specialty specific designs they should be reporting. Oh yeah? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're losing your audio a little. Maybe you want to turn off your video. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, let me see. Uh, is that any better? Yes, that's better. Okay. I am in the hospital and we know the Wi-Fi here can be a bit rough sometimes. My apologies. Just let me know if I break out again. I will. Uh, thank you. And... Uh, so people continued to report that they didn't know what kinds of things they should be reporting, um, which was a similar concern to the hospital-wide system. And so this really gave us some areas of opportunity or some uh, potential areas of intervention. And so our iterative improvements as a result of the work that we did with the Evaluation Sciences Unit were in kind of three areas, pessimism about quality reporting, feedback that was desired from reporters, and overall engagement of our faculty with the new system. In order to address the pessimism, we increased our communication with the department around ongoing projects that we've already worked on. And we have worked to send out a more frequent newsletter about the ongoing efforts that we have. We're also working to improve the structure of our response to reporters with stakeholders for more formal feedback, in particular to reporters so that they see we're working hard on their behalf. There's more outreach to them, uh, requesting more uh, specific 
uh, details about the uh, the episode or the event, uh, and then also to discuss with them uh, what what steps were taken um, to resolve the issue. We have seen a continued stable engagement month over month with the system, and we've been able to track the success or challenges associated with new clinical workflows or go lives. Um, and in order to do this to help socialize the system with ongoing education, we've increased our panel of rev reviewers. So we have more people interacting with the data, reviewing the data, becoming more familiar with what types of things are reported. And this means that um, we can socialize at a, at a more broad level and uh, make it much more uh, standard and natural to engage with the reporting system. The collaboration with the ESU definitely made this project possible. They really helped us to ask more informed and guided questions to challenge assumptions that we had about what we thought the underlying problems were. Step one of any quality project is understand your baseline and understand your problem. So they helped us to dig more deeply into our assumptions about barriers. They provided significant data analysis and visualization help, not just with the interview components, but with analyzing all of our data that we had. They definitely elevated the science behind engagement, digging deeper into barriers and facilitators for engagement. They introduced this whole new idea of a mixed methods model of evaluating our study or our intervention. They cleaned and collected and resourced so much data for us and really kept an academic lens on this quality improvement project, which allowed it to be much more successful. And we had a huge team of people involved in the project. Brian Bateman was a solid um, uh, advocate for us, our department chair, William Gostick. He is my partner, the physician improvement lead for the department. And this was really his brainchild to get this uh, system developed and deployed. Dan Gessner did a lot of the building on the back end. Uh, he and Will worked really well together to get this deployed in Epic. Our entire quality reporting subcommittee who reviews all one to 200 reports every month, categorizes them and sends them off for follow-up. Our safe reporting team who we worked closely with when we developed this, our anesthesia techs and our biomedical engineers who we are constantly reaching out to uh, to fix the problems that are reported to us, and our interventional platform leadership. They've all been integral members of our project. But again, thank you, ESU. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, so Simulated or simulate a lot of uh, questions in the chat. And um, I'll invite the people who have submitted questions in the chat to come off uh, mute. Um, uh, I think the first question was from Lee Stone regarding the visibility of reports in Epic. Um, and I know you had a lot of follow up questions, Lee. So I'll hand the floor, uh, mic to you. Hi, Ashley. Good to see you again. Hi. Uh, no, my question was related to, so, you know, a lot of the problems you mentioned with the system-wide issue, I think, stem from the fact that it's done in MIDAS, and MIDAS is an old program. Almost every hospital seems to use it. It's like DOS-based, so very old-school computer, um, but it looks like your SSIRS is using the EPIC data entry fields. So my first question is, you know, MIDAS was chosen specifically to keep these kinds of reports out of the patient's medical record and to keep all association like nurses are even forbidden from mentioning safe reports in their notes in epic how does the system am i mistaken in that it's using epic data entry fields and if it is using epic data entry fields how is it keeping this information out of the patient's medical record so it's not a part of discovery yeah that's a fantastic question and unfortunately i was brought onto the team after it was uh, fully developed and deployed. Um, I know of ways to keep data entry separate from the medical record in EPIC, and I know that this employs one of those ways, but I don't know which one it is. Dan Gessner um, built this and constructed this. We initially had a red cap type um, uh, data entry uh, option uh, from the EPIC, or separate from the EPIC um, option, uh, but we then integrated that uh, data capture tool into EPIC, into this current iteration that you see, and that allowed us to make it a requirement on chart closure, uh, 
Um, but I do know that the data is kept separate from the patient's medical record and the patient, if they requested their medical record, would not have any of this information attached to it, even if it were a complete medical record request. I'm happy to um, ask Dan and follow up with you on how they crafted that, if that would be helpful for you. Great. Um, our next question uh, relates to the interaction between the hospital-wide and the anesthesiology support system from Sierra Kane. Yeah, just curious to hear a little bit more about kind of what that workflow looks like and how that information is getting passed between the two systems. I think there was a similar question in the chat a little bit later about um, what if you had any data on how frequently folks are actually submitting those duplicative reports um, in the hospital-wide system? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and one that we anticipated because our engagement is so low with the, and I think I can use the term safe because everybody here um, knows uh, our safe system. Uh, that's the formal or the um, you know generic name for our hospital-based reporting system. So our, our engagement with safe is is pretty low. Um, and our thought was we are unlikely to be replacing reports that would otherwise be submitted to SAFE. These are probably new reports that would never have been reported anywhere. So uh, with that being said, um, we, we hoped and we think that we are not um, reducing the amount of information that is sent to our hospital safe team. Um, the agreement that we had with our hospital safe team is we would uh, we would try to facilitate access to safe reporting. And they've actually done a great job recently going live with a new in EMR button that accesses safe reporting. And so it makes it quite a bit easier to hit that button up in the cup, upper left hand corner of the patient's record. And a lot of the fields that were previously challenging to fill out are, are pre-populated, at least with the patient's name and MRN. And it reduces that step of accessing the hospital intranet. Um, now, a lot of the technical barriers to accessing SAFE remain for physicians because we are employed by the School of Medicine, not by the hospital. And that may not seem like it's a big deal, but when it comes to the different uh, servers, particularly the SharePoint server that's gone live with recently, um, computers can get stuck in a login that doesn't allow us to log into SharePoint. Uh, and so um, that kind of modification of our information systems in the hospital can have unintended consequences on access to these types of reporting tools. Uh, we have not done a serious job of trying to promote use of that safe button in the upper left hand corner. We've done a lot of, of like, you know, verbal communication that that safe button exists in Epic and you can use it. Um, but we haven't pushed people to go there yet because some of the barriers still remain and that the drop down boxes in the safe system still don't quite use language as as um, that correlates as well to our practice, clinical practice. And so I think we will get more information if we encourage people both to use our system. And then when you have a have an event that has crossover with something that the hospital needs to know about, we link them to that, that link down below and it can be easier to access that way. We are um, also have some reports. We had uh, just anecdotally an issue with a radiation exposure uh, in an OR not too long ago. Um, some things that look like se serious safety events, um, and we forward those over to the safe team to take a look at. Uh, and we're looking at how we can standardize that information flow. We're currently sharing a lot of the information with our interventional platform quality leadership. Uh, they're the folks who ultimately receive the safe reports from the safe team and are tasked with following up on safety issues in the interventional platform. And so we're standardizing how we share these reports. Um, but it's definitely a delicate balance. Uh, we feel that one of the reasons we are able to, to get a lot of engagement with the reporting platform is um, there is a sense of trust uh, and a sense of safety around submitting a report, which might seem uh, less consequential on the surface, but 
uh, might have greater implications to you know workplace relationships. Um, and so we're trying to navigate this carefully uh, and safely so that leadership within the Department of Anesthesia can see things like, oh, um, you know, the, our IV bags are falling apart. Like, why is this happening? You know, our induction meds are, are falling on the floor and we, we see a pattern in this so we can go take a look. Oh, there was a process change in, in how we put our IV kits together and um, so we can investigate that. It's really allowed us to do some really interesting projects. But we continue to work and try to be thoughtful around this interplay between required, mandated, important hospital reporting and the ability to improve the quality of anesthesia care that we deliver. So I think it's really important to just have open lines of communication between all stakeholders, keep everybody up to date on, on, your, on the project, on what we're doing with it, um, and, and try to continue to be as open as we can with, with our SAFE team and with our interventional platform leadership. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. Absolutely. And I think you spoke to a lot of the challenges in terms of finding that balance between, you know, having this be dynamic at the department level where you can actually effectively make change versus, you know, creating opportunity and visibility, you know, at higher levels to see some of these um, problems that might be happening hospital wide as opposed to in one individual department. Thank exactly. You said it better than I could have. And I just have to take a moment to see a shout out. I see Michelle Arteaga on the call. She was one of the foundational members of this group. She put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to the first two years of this project. She's no longer with us on our on this project, but uh, Michelle is one of the founding crew, um, ride or die quality reporting system subcommittee members. So thanks for being here. This is, a lot of this project is Michelle to thank for too. Oh, thanks, Ashley. I just wanted to come and see all the updates that you guys have made. I'm so proud of all the progress you have done in this project and the collaboration from the ESU has been so awesome. I had a question in terms of like, you know, this was an ICDP project and I know the original goals was in terms of, you know, completing follow-up, completing projects. Do you, does any project kind of stand out or an effort in terms of like that what was uncovered with the system um, that's kind of ongoing or maybe was another ICDP project for the following year or anything like that? Yeah, great question. So um, initially we had a lot of reports on ergonomics of the anesthesia practice environment in some of our anesthetizing locations. And it's not just that you get back pain, but that you're physically unable to get to your patient in a moment of patient instability in some of our anesthetizing locations. Um, and so we have elevated that and are actually able to work with interventional platform leadership to try to you know, physically move things around in the room to make it a structurally safer place to work. Um, we are in the middle of that. Um, that is a painful long process. All of these are painful long processes. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, another project uh, that I found really satisfying from a quality improvement perspective, uh, although small, was in our um, electrophysiology rooms. The electrophysiologists spend several hours at the patient's bedside mapping the electrical circuitry of the heart and they mumble into a microphone with, and they wear headphones and they just mumble to each other about where the circuits are and what they look like. And then all of a sudden they're done. And, um, you know, the anesthesiologist isn't really included in that conversation because oftentimes we don't have one of those headsets. And so we identified this as a problem. We had a project to label a headset, make sure it was charged every day and sat over on the anesthesia workstation. Now the anesthesiologist is involved, can anticipate when the patient's gonna be placed into an unstable rhythm, uh, can communicate more effectively with the procedural team to reduce stress to the patient, and then can plan the anesthetic better and have a faster wake up time um, with access to that headphone. Uh, I then put that project to sleep and put it into what we call uh, monitor mode, and then about nine months later, I started getting reports that there was no headphone available again. So I went in and sure enough, the headset that was labeled with anesthesia uh, was broken. So we had to get a new one with a fresh battery and, and whatnot. So that's the type of very simple example. There's a lot more high-end examples of the quality improvement process just kind of working um, and, and being able to go back and monitor things. We, I think one of the great things is we can look at, I alluded to this, 
uh, new workflows that are deployed. The interventional platform has so many different lines of, of leadership, nursing, uh, technicians, uh, ORAs, uh, circulators, physician surgeons, physician anesthesiologists, PAs. Each one of them can deploy a new workflow kind of at any time, and they do their best to communicate platform-wide, but sometimes it, it just doesn't happen. And so I alluded to some of the IV bags kind of becoming disconnected, the IV tubings. And so we saw a spike in reports of IV tubings are continually becoming disconnected. And we realized a new group of, uh, a new role in the OR was putting these together. And so we could track the rate of IV tubing failure over time as we then tried to educate this group on how to do it properly and bring in education from the people who used to do it um, on how to avoid these kinds of pitfalls. And so um, I think Sierra, you commented earlier how to keep it dynamic and responsive. And that's exactly what I think we've been able to do is really um, dynamically respond to new challenges in the OR. Uh, we've been able to get the manufacturer of one of our medication labeling scanners to come to the OR and completely overhaul the way our, our medication label labeling machines um, communicate via Wi-Fi to get updates on new drugs in the drawer. Um, and so the company now has to come out and retrofit all of our machines that came from the quality reporting uh, database. Um, we got a lot of medication lookalike sound alike. So we're collecting information to support introduction of new medication safety protocols like scanning medications. Um, we used the quality reporting system to track blood waste in the OR. Um, and so we used it uh, partly to reduce the amount of red blood cell products that we have to throw away at the end of a case. I could go on and on, but it just, it's been a fire hydrant, but at the same time, um, really helpful, I think. Awesome. Um, questions in the chat. Do you want me yes. to? Yes. Olga Grujic had the next question involving how is compliance involved? Olga, if you could, if you want to get off uh, or get <laughs> sure. on video. Sure. Actually, I think that uh, Dr. Dr. Peterson answered most of the questions uh, to uh, previously. Uh, she wasn't involved in the initial, and I'm going to assume that compliance along with our safety team was there. And I just wanted to congratulate you on all of the work, because honestly, having those reports, regardless of where they come from, uh, and making problems visible is the number one way of improving quality of care. And so uh, really appreciate all your work. I don't think that I, the questions have been primarily answered. So thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate that sentiment. And I think some people can look at and I oftentimes look at what the amount of work it requires, and Michelle knows the amount of work it requires to review and um, keep track of these reports and deal with them in a responsible way um, is sometimes overwhelming. And when Michelle left our team, I think I cried. Um, but uh, it's exactly like what you said, Olga, where only pro problems that become visible or elevated and are seen um, can be addressed and care can be improved. And so when you look at creating a parallel reporting system, which is essentially what it is to our EPIC system, or excuse me, to our safe reporting system, that, that is controversial, um, you know, generating a, a, a second set of data um, in parallel to an existing data, an existing reporting system. It is a bit like reinventing a wheel and having multiple wheels on a bus, but Again, we can't fix anything we can't see. And we we felt it, it was a priority to improve physician anesthesiology engagement with quality reporting because we are um, inherently quality driven, risk averse patient advocates who are looking for every way anything could go wrong in an OR. Um, for our patients. That's not to say everyone else isn't. Nurses definitely have a strong um, uh, strong uh, slant towards that. Um, but it's an important perspective. I think we were trying to prioritize uh, getting that heard. Um, I just wanted to thank you for doing that duplication of efforts because many services, I support cardiovascular health quality council and we review our uh, safe reports that are both in our units and affecting our patients. And so we appreciate it when uh, your reports are duplicated in the safe because that is the only way that we can see problems. So again, thank you. Yeah, definitely. 
see the next questions from Christina Davis. Are you still available? Oh, hi. Yes. Um, it was touched on basically uh, like briefly, but I was just wondering since there is the Midas EHR integration, which I realized wasn't present when you started this work. I, you did talk about some of the concerns with the single sign-on and uh, SharePoint, but is there any discussion of integrating? Because as I think Janine mentions, as well as just concerns over timeliness of sharing safety information and the ability to integrate further with the um, system-wide approach. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the integration that would be most helpful that we didn't... Um, that there wasn't um, kind of a, a, a path forward or, or steps forward, um, even when that button came live, is actually adjusting the interface of Midas once you get into it. Um, and so I think, you know, when you look at, and I probably should have put a screenshot of the Midas interface up compared to the checklist form that we have, um, but there are just, and it might seem small, but there are like three drop downs at the top of Midas. That's like location, patient location, and the location trying to find where you are given a random anesthetizing location in like um, radiation therapy or brachytherapy in the basement. Like, how do you how do you pick a location? And so a lot of our providers were like, well, I never would have put in anything about brachytherapy because I would have clicked into Midas and I wouldn't have known and I can't complete it unless I do. And so some of those really simple early steps, um, uh, uh, there, there's not really a path forward as of yet that we've seen with the safe team on how to actually physically change how Midas looks to, to encourage engagement. And certainly if that becomes a possibility, we would definitely be open to doing that. Um, and I think the other half of it is, you know, integrating more effectively with the Safe Report team, which is something that uh, Will and I now have done. We've met with a lot of um, the leaders in Safe, and we've now been involved in, you know, CRCs and met, um, you know, the trifecta of folks who lead those. And so we're better integrated into the the Safe Report distribution um, system. So we we see those now, and um, you know, honestly, I, I hope in the future we can merge the two because it's a lot of work. Um, but we scan, I scan every report on Friday. So at least once a week we look at reports. Um, and I I do trust that our faculty, um, most of the time when there's like an emergency local like Sandal, like you find rock uranium in the Sugamidex in, um, compartment, um, they're texting us and emailing us right away and we're sending out alerts immediately when there are critical safety issues. Um, so that's something about, you know, socializing, who do you call if there's a big critical safety event? Um, and then we're able to quickly send out emails to the department as well. But I agree, integration would be ideal. I think the biggest barrier is the structure of MIDAS right now it just doesn't reflect uh, the clinical practice of anesthesia in the OR as well as it as, as our system does. I think Janine Johnson's question may tie into something you just said. Janine, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, and I was just, you basically did just address this, but um, I was just asking if you're concerned about the timeliness of sharing the safety information yeah. um, with the safe system. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think um, it's, you know, honestly challenging to, you know, get five minutes in a day just to review the week's reports. Um, on a Friday, I have not in my, oh my gosh, how long has it been a year and a half or two years, um, re yet read a report that made me think, oh, you know, we need, this needs to be fixed, like in the next 10 minutes, or we're leaving a patient open for, um, you know, serious harm. Um, that being said, there is the possibility that somebody reports something on a Monday and I don't see it until Friday. Um, and there is a possibility that we don't have a standard systematic review of, of a case until the quality reporting team um, takes a look at it. And I think that's one of the big values of our system is, you know, that I probably should speak up a little bit as our quality reporting subcommittee. Um, you know, made up of 25 volunteers that rotate through and they read every report. 
And what they're able to provide is context for some of the reports or um, uh, you know, provide a little bit more uh, credence to you know some reports like oh you know I've experienced this report quite often it might be the only one we've ever gotten but I experienced this a lot and it's actually a pain point um, and a problem for patient care in this way you know we have a complex new uh, patient care pathway and brachytherapy to ensure that patients have pain relief for the continuity of their treatment um, because of this and you know development of patient care pathways from a physician led um, effort will probably have a different um, outcome than, you know, a critical event review of a patient who is in pain in during a brachytherapy procedure. Um, and so the engagement that we get to problem solve the reports, I think is, um, is more unique to the operating environment than the type of response that would be generated from, say, a critical event review from the safe team. Uh, and so the way that we've kind of socialized and um, I want to say like communism where everybody works together, like a commune, like we have a group of anesthesiologists that are working together to try to problem solve and develop solutions. Um, I think that's really unique to our system. So it's not just the reports, but it's also what we do with them um, that I think uh, leads to more robust um, solutions just for the interventional platform. We have a couple minutes left. So are there any other questions out in the audience or anyone who put a question in the chat that I missed? Yeah, Dr. Peterson, um, I was just wondering if you could share with us an example of something that would meet the criteria for submission to the SSR IRS, but not meet some criteria for submission to the system IRS? Yes, there are some. Um, if I go back here and look, um, there are some that don't pop up as uh, because they actually don't. And off the top of my head, I don't remember which ones they are, but there are some. If I just look at the list, um, it's like uh, equipment technology, they all do communication, care coordination, those ones do. I think there's some of our um, um, like case cancellation ones, like delay of case or case scheduling issues. Those don't require a safe report. Um, and let's see, PACU holds and ICU holds. Those are things that don't require reports, but we track them. Um, we've had some complications with patients who are holding in the ICUs, particularly in the um, CVH service line. Uh, if Olga's there, she probably um, remembers dealing with some complications with patients on ICU bed holds. Uh, so we really try to reduce those. And so it's something that we can track through this system and see if we have an increase uh, in PACU hold or ICU hold. Uh, some days we notice, or some weeks we notice that there are quite a, quite a lot of, of PACU holds. Um, and so we reached out to PACU on some occasions, PACU leadership, and they say, yeah, this is actually a tough week for us. We had a lot of sick calls, um, not a lot of redundancy in staffing. And so we, we see that um, trend over time. So there are some in there that are a little less spicy, if you will. Actually, I think it's interesting that you gave those examples as things that we wouldn't put into Midas as event. We've actually done queries specifically from Midas from safe looking to see if there are increased holds or increased concerns over patient safety mm -hmm. related to those holds. So that's information that's currently being held in the um, service line specific incident reporting system and not in the others, but people are querying, trying to see if there's any trends and they're not making it into the trend in. Hmm. Um, it was, we had this uh, list of all of the different categories and um, and check boxes approved by the safe team. They basically said, yep, we want to hear this, this, and this. So include the link after them. Um, and so those were the ones that we included the link to. And I think like some, if there's a behavioralism thing, we have the other link to the behavioralism one in there as well. So um, if we need to review and revise those, happy to, happy to um, expand on what we recommend. I think the majority of them, the safe 
uh, completion uh, URL cop pops up. There's only a few that it doesn't. And every time I do one, I'm like, oh, okay, great. I don't have to. <laughs> And then um, Mohana Roy, I've seen you come on and off video. Did you have a question? No, no question. Sorry about the distracting on oh, and off. It's topic. okay. Just wanted to make sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we have a couple minutes left. So, any other questions in the audience? This has been a wonderful discussion, Jennifer. Yeah, I have one quick question. You might have already answered this, Dr. Peterson, but with the with the reports that do prompt to enter a safe. Do you ever have a, a third person um, kind of enter that as kind of a, you know, administrative function? Um, they may not have been involved, but they just kind of do the, the data entry to make sure it gets in both systems. Yeah, we do. We do. And um, there are pretty specific situations in which, you know, there was like multiple service lines involved in a certain event. And, you know, we talk with the reporter and we say, um, you know, this really requires a safe to be submitted. Um, are you willing to submit one or can we submit one on your behalf? Um, and if they're like, oh, heck no, I don't know. And they're like, oh, yeah. So we go in and submit the safe um, and that's fine. Or sometimes they're like, oh, yeah, I can do that, too. Um, we typically find that, you know, we ask people to um, submit a safe and they don't. And we see one not come through. So we put one in anyway. Um, but we do always ask ahead of time um, because there is uh, a concern for um, visibility once a safe is um, put in. So they're, they're, I think we want to respect the confidentiality of reporters. Um, they know that it's not anonymous when they submit through the specialty specific system. Um, but we always like to ask permission before we submit the safe. We've never had a situation where we thought it needed to be submitted and they said no. Oh, happy Patient Safety Awareness Week. Is it really Patient Safety Awareness Week? Oh my goodness. Fantastic. Yeah, party. Woohoo. Oh, I love all of the parties. Perfect timing then. I know. <laughs> That's perfect timing, to be honest. Um, but it is almost 1255. So I want to thank you all for being here. And um, yes, the recording will be available on the SMCI website relatively soon. And thank you, Ashley, for what a wonderful talk and wonderful discussion. Um, and I hope I just put my email real quick. I just put my email in the chat. Any thoughts come up? Um, I think a lot of folks are maybe with the safe team here. And if you want to do any more work together, always open to that. Um, so my email's right there. Thank you. Oh, hi, Kingy. Awesome. Great. Yes. And yeah, hope to see you all in two weeks at our March 26th uh, seminar. Thank you all. Thank you, ESU.